We're doing a giveaway on this hoodie, so please just stay to the end of the video to find out how you can get entered to win the super cool, super neat, super comfortable, slightly larger than I normally wear, but very nonetheless cool hoodie. So just, just wait till the end. Thank you. Muscle cars, Los Angeles, the United States of America, and pretty much every single time you talk to an old person about cars, they rubbed it in their face that back in their day, it was way better than the way that it is now. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm talking in all caps lock, but we're gonna bring it down to like about this level so that I can actually talk, breathe, and just speed along with all the information that we're gonna talk about when it comes down to the origin of domestic aftermarket wheels. I'm using my hands because there is a ton of shit to talk about and we're gonna start it off right at the beginning. You have the history of BBS in Schiltok, Germany. You have the iconic history of Volk in Osaka. You have all the interesting history of American racing in the United States of America. So we're gonna go into the beginning of aftermarket wheels. We're taking it back into the days of like carriages and, and wood and Henry Ford and Oregon Trail. We're bringing it back. You had people modifying wooden carriages with like painted wheels and stained undercarriages and people doing weird shit. Oh, Carolyn, stop painting the wheels. We're gonna get dysentery like Joseph did. And just like Deadpool 2, things got better from the original. People started switching from the wooden carriage wheels to things like steel wheels. You had companies and people like Carl Benz that were getting into actual wheels that were made of metal and other things that really they were just trying to make because wood wheels were obviously not that reliable. Carl Benz developed a motor wagon in 1885 with Michelin tires and I put the Dr. Evil tires around that because it was pretty much just a solid rubber piece that went around the wheel and from there people just started modifying anything that they possibly could with their vehicles. Good old Henry Ford was doing the same thing with his steel welded spoke wheels because gosh darn it you US of A, we're doing the same thing too. Let's go to California, probably a good 30 years later. You had big names trying to make a scene. Vic Edelbrock, Roy Richter, Phil Wyan, Robert Wyan, Ted Halibrand, Roy Vachon were all people that were just getting started in the SoCal culture. When it comes down to anything automotive related, California was the place to be. These guys were icons. They pretty much created what everybody knows and loves about the car community today. And starting it out with wheels, Roy Vachon was the man. He would take your original wheels back in the day, cut out the faces, flip them around, weld them back in, either with your existing barrels or he made wider barrels for you, strap them back onto your car and sell them for a premium so that you had a wider, deep dished wheel for your car, which is probably the most bad thing I've ever heard of. And when it came to wheels, that was pretty much all you could do. That was until a Douglas aircraft representative named Ted Halibrand decided, F that, I'm gonna do something different. Ted Halibrand made wheels for pretty much every single facet of the automotive racing scene in the United States of America. Whether it was midget racing, which sounds really weird when I say it like that, drag racing, autocrossing, turnstile racing, or anything in between, Ted Halibrand was the man to go to for wheels. You had racing classes like the Le Mans, Formula One. You know the pin thing? Like the thing that's got like the three spokes that like shot out from the wheel and then you would like hammer it and then it had the six pin spine thing. That's, that's Halibrand, that's his thing. That man and his company was an American racing icon. And then American racing happened, which is something completely different from Ted Halibrand and is something that you probably also remember as one of the iconic aftermarket wheels in America. You had pioneers making these things like Jim Ellingson, Roy Richter, and all the people that made American racing what it was and what it is to this day. Romeo Palomides was the guy that pretty much sat there staring at aircraft planes, which was essentially the actual a money maker back in the day and said could 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 we steal that for for cause could we could we do that do you think would facebook mind would let's steal it let's 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 use that let's use that the torque thrust was born angels wept republicans and democrats finally stopped arguing my wife 
finally stopped buying mason jars. Seriously, Rebecca, I don't need a separate mason jar for my toothbrush and my toothpaste. They can go in one mason jar. I don't need two. American Racing was considered by most to be one of the newest gen's first primary pioneer aftermarket wheel company in the United States that birthed from the American racing heritage of Southern California. They were the guys. They were the, the one company that was made in the good old United States of America. Woo! You also had names like Dick Beef. <laughs> Dick. That was pretty much the first ET mag in aluminum, which is, by the way, kind of a little bit of a controversial topic when you talk to American Racing about it. But he was also iconic in his own right for making that wheel. He was also one of the first people to introduce a unilug system that was essentially just a way to shim the lugs so that you could put 4x75 or 4.75 onto a 5x5 lug pattern or a 4.5 lug pattern. It was frowned upon then. It's frowned upon now. Why would you ever do that? And all of these names came because of these three things. They were either one, just coming out of the war, two, originally had no plans to start making wheels, and three, or three, actually just hung out at Bell's Auto Parts, which was the place. If there was a place that you would say started all of the aftermarket performance, all the aftermarket wheels, all the aftermarket everything, it's Bell's. These guys were making stuff because no one else was. There was no Google. You couldn't just go home and sit at the desk and have your 1949 Packard in the back and jump on Google because it didn't exist at the time. You had to go out and literally make your own wheels. The only reason any of these companies existed, whether you were talking about wheels or performance parts or anything in between, was because people legitimately just didn't make them at the time. They had to make them themselves because they wanted to. Imagine you wanting to have a part for your car, but it not existing, and then you existing in the hub of American racing heritage. And voila, you have what sparked the actual culture of cars and wheels in America. The hot rod era revolutionized the American racing degree because of the fact that everybody just got done with the war and everybody was happy because we won and the fact that we came back and we had a lot of money. Businesses could barely keep up and because the business was booming, that meant people wanted to do more extravagant things to essentially get themselves out there. So what did they do? They built bigger wheels because they had bigger, I mean, they had bigger cars that they were putting these bigger wheels on and then ultimately you had bigger wheels that looked cooler. A lot of people started to really get involved in customizing their wheels. And then the 70s and 80s came along. The night is dark and full of terrors. Environmentalists were finally getting their way in the Congress and hippies were just doing a lot of drugs. Ultimately, the car world, they just didn't have anything that they could do because it was too expensive. But there was one hobby still kicking, the lowriders. With so much more of the car scene resting from its rock star dragging days that was switched and substituted for cruising from the low riding scene. People were spending less time on the track and spending more time just driving around because at the end of the day, it cost less. It went from going fast to going slow and trying to keep everything growing, but at the same time, the passion never died. It just changed. Things got flashier, brightier, and chromier, and chromier is not a word. And that started to substitute function in wheels to form. You had companies going from their straight Craig or Mag days to going to Dayton wire wheels. Now, Dayton's been around since 1916, and if you didn't know, they're probably one of the most iconic wheels when it comes to just wheels. If you don't know Dayton's, go out there, look at Dayton's, talk to Jasper. He loves them. He wants them on his BMW. They're just like the wheels when it comes down to low riding days, and they didn't really blow up until the 70s hit, and they hit hard. They hit like a, like, like, puberty they hit like they just it wasn't good but because the scene began to grow things changed and people didn't really care because there was nothing really as cool as just like hammering down your d's before going down whittier boulevard that was the thing that people did that's what kept the american wheel scene alive 
and it became the wheel that defined the low riding culture of the 70s, which was pretty much the only culture that existed. Then JD Gregg from Tulsa, Oklahoma decided to f the whole thing clean up because he could. The 80s finally came around. The environmentalists were going away. Congress was back to yelling at each other and just like everything else in the world, the hippies went back to doing normal jobs, turned into parents, and now we have our generation because we're doing just fine. And that's when you had somebody like JD come along and say, but what if the wheels were spinning, but then the car wasn't? JD, are you high? But here's the thing, the lowrider scene was having a blast. They were rolling down Whittier. Ah! they were having a good time. And then the, the domestic racing scene was coming back because gas prices were going back down because we realized we weren't running out of oil and then they were coming back. And then there was this, this little third guy. He was a little shy, like, hey, buddy, it's gonna be all right. Come on out, come on out. You can, you can hang out with the cool kids and you can hang out with us. And then the, the, kid, came, the kid came out and then they were like, no, you can't because that was the tuner scene. The tuner scene was finally coming around in the 80s. You had TSW in the early 80s going public. You had Koenig wheels. You had American Racing coming up, making all of these wheels. And the tuner scene was getting hot, it was getting heavy, and it was getting moist in California. Drink, drink, I'm moist. People wanted to start getting into the tuner scene. And this is where it got really, really weird. Why have a big, long boat of a car that could go fast in a straight mile when you could have something that feels good and rolls around the countryside, the hilly landscape of Los Angeles, and have something that's sporty and quirky and fun? You could have something that you didn't know that the reliability was complete dog because it was a Mazda RX-7 or a Datsun 240Z. And that's when the whole culture really started to splinter because you had companies and wheel companies alike making wheels for function for the drag strip, for car show people that wanted to roll around on the streets. And then you had this tuner scene coming in and getting involved and the whole thing just blew up to high hell because everybody thought that it was just gonna be about making wheels to go down the drag strip in a straight line. You had all these things happening and because of the late 60s creation of SEMA, you had all of these companies coming together every year and the business was booming. Everybody wanted to have everybody else's wheels and because there was so much competition, there were so many different companies involved that there was this whole macro economic boom of the aftermarket car accessory division and wheels was one of the biggest things that you could buy. And not only that, but with CFC tech that was coming out in the 80s and 90s, it made prototyping wheels just that much cheaper for all of these wheel companies to try making different style wheels. So now you had companies making 10 different or 15 different styles versus like two. But now you had Dayton's, you had American Racing, you had Krager, you had Motegi, you had TSW, you had Koenig, and you had everything else happening at the same time that ultimately resulted in this entire market exploding and the entire car culture ate it alive like it was pancakes on Saturday morning. Everybody wanted to tell everybody else why their style of car culture was the best style of car culture. But here's what was happening. Aftermarket wheels were getting bigger because bigger meant better. You couldn't go past an outcast song in the early 90s without them mentioning the fact that if you didn't have 18s on your car, you were pretty much a poser. Even companies like Ford and Chevrolet were trying to keep up with their sport car scene and making bigger wheels with them from the factory in hopes that they would and swap them out. And then the 2000s came swinging in terms of a generation change and the fact that everything that was once cool was now not cool. What was once hype was now just history. Companies like American Racing and Kreger and Dayton were getting pushed to the side for new revolutionary brands that we know and hear of today. Companies like Niche and Rotoform and TSW and Enki, along with brands from international side of things like Volk and BBS and Gram Lights and Rays and all of those those companies started to get into the United States of America and the days of simple muscle car wheels were no longer in. Wheels have taken inspiration from the designs that have come Oceanside. And now you get the domestic wheel game of what it is today. You still have the legends making wheels and you have new domestic companies like Vossen taking it in their own way. What wheels were once blocky five spokes are now thin multi-spoke infinity lip designs. You have wheels coming out that are still in the same way American, but nevertheless 
not like anything American wheels have been like in the past. But just like anything cool, it's fun to reminisce about days that have long passed. So if you're interested in picking up wheels, tires, suspension, head of the Fitment Industries, Com. We have all of that. And of course, if you're looking to win this hoodie, all you have to do is first off subscribe, say that you subscribed in the comment section, then drop a comment below and what you'd like us to talk about next. We will pick the top rated comment on YouTube and we will give you first a sweatshirt and then we're gonna steal your idea and make a video out of it. So I'm Alex from Fitment Industries. Let us know what you guys think of this video and let us know if you want us to make more and we will see you later. Peace.